business you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for frame rate is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Frame Rate is brought to you by MailRoute, email filtering in the cloud for companies and resellers of any size. MailRoute offers live support and one click sign up. For free Postini migration and 10% off the life of your account, visit MailRoute.net, click the sign up button, and enter the promo code FRAMERATE. And by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker looking for videos, photos, illustrations, music, sound effects, after effects templates, or 3D models, check out Pond5.com. And for an exclusive 15% off this month, use code FRAMERATE10. See that person jogging? There's a shirtless man (laughs) jogging wearing a horse mask. (laughs) I'm not quite sure what that's all about. But uh, Un and Aaron, I think that uh, perhaps some people are getting a little stir crazy early in this this thing. I don't know where he came from. (laughs) <laughs> but I guess there's, there's, an, there's an attitude with storms. You can either be scared and, uh, you know, hide in your house, or you can have a sense of humor about it. And that's all I can say about that guy, is I think he's got a sense of humor about it and obviously wanting to get a little bit of attention. <laughs> we are obliging him. We are obliging him. Yes, but I yes. also have to tell you, it's cold out here. I'm wearing all of this stuff. All right, so go, true. go, go. It's Frame Rate! Welcome to Frame Rate episode 99. I'm Tom Merritt. Holy cow, I'm Brian Brushwood. And are we really at 99? That's almost 100. Yeah, is, why? Is that a significant number for some reason? Is uh, that... if, if you like if you like base 10 Oh, digits. you're into base 10, aren't you? Oh, I forgot about that about you, yeah. Me and base 10. I'm, all, right. all the other bases suck. I'm all about the base 10. All your base 10 are belong to us, people, Back. because you're on frame rate now, and we're totally, this episode's going to get uh, taken down by the robot unless we go and make that small. I'm just telling you right now. Which one? Well, that, the opening oh, no. video of Horse Boy, because that was a weather yeah. channel, right? Uh, yeah, I guess oh, yeah. so. The robot, the robot sees that full screen in our, our feed. We're toast. You know what? I actually have. I actually have a takedown penalization story that I want to share when you talk about your story, when we talk about the big story. This just in, the big story. Can I just say, too, that you have it listed as shirtless jogging horse boy, and every time I look at it, I don't see the R. <laughs> you think it like uh, I, I see it as shiftless jogging horse <laughs> shiftless. Like when's he gonna get a job That jogging horse <laughs> that boy Shiftless horse boy Oh he's out in the hurricanes around in hurricanes. Uh, But yes uh, our big story uh, Is my simple.tv Setup experience uh, I got my simple TV If you don't know what it is We've talked about it a bunch on frame rate uh, Device that costs you $150 And gives you live television DVR capabilities through multiple devices. You can actually see it in any web browser, uh, as well as on the Roku in an app, uh, or on iOS and Android apps that are forthcoming. Although I actually tried on my Nexus, I think, uh, my Nexus 7, and I was able to watch it through the browser on the Nexus 7. So it's actually, uh, and I think I I used it on my iPad as well through the browser. So it's actually uh, accessible in a lot of different places. That's the antenna that we're showing right there. You don't get that with it. That's the simple TV uh, and you have to plug in a hard drive to it yourself. So there's a little bit of assembly required. It's not as simple <laughs> as maybe it would be for some people. For me, I was like, oh, yeah, I've got a hard drive around here somewhere. Dunk, plugged it right in. It was frustrating to set up. Really? Uh, on Friday night, when we got, or when, maybe it was Saturday night. Yeah, it was Saturday night. When we got the, uh, it's a simple TV arrived at my door. I opened it up, plugged it in. Easy to plug in, easy to connect, you know, very, very, very simple uh, for somebody who knows what an Ethernet connection and a, and a cable connection look like. And then I had to go to my 
laptop to set it up. You had to set it up over your local network. So I'm like, well, that's kind of a pain, but all right. I'd rather just, first of all, have everything set up from the device itself, but okay. So I go to the laptop. I go to simple.tv slash setup. The site was down. Oh, dude. Well, I mean, you kind of run into this whenever there's a premiere, when something's brand new, the servers get slammed. They don't plan on this many people hitting them up or they don't realize that they're limited on it. I mean, did that super annoy you or? It super annoyed me because I, like I said, would prefer it be done inside the device. There's no reason for me to have to use the internet to set it up. Uh, yeah. Uh, but, okay, fine. Maybe there is. Maybe because I have to get the guide information in there. Whatever. You have to pay $5 a month for the guide. I get it free because I did a Kickstarter backup. Whatever. Okay, fine. The next day, it the site is finally up. It took me hours of going back and forth to this thing because I would get it to a certain point and it would just hang. Uh, so, for instance, I would get it to a point where it's like updating the firmware and then it just would hang. It hung for an hour. I just let it churn thinking maybe it'll work no it didn't so i reload the page on my browser i go back through the setup sets that i've already gone through updates the firmware fine it goes now I'm downloading guide information and it would hang so i reload the browser and all of this is like i'm going away and doing other stuff right now, uh, now, okay, and so now, i had to restart it's... this thing about five times to finally make it through the setup without hanging finally get through the setup i turn the thing on it does work right it works fine the Roku app is very laggy and kind of buggy. Uh, it, it's, it, I can see the brilliance of what it can be because you get all of the channels uh, that you get live. That was one of the setup steps. They had to scan your channels, right? They show up as the, you know, on your Roku in little boxes, and the guide tells you exactly what's playing. So I could see, like, oh, there's an NFL game here, and there's, like, Latino television here, and there's a cooking show there. And then you click. It takes forever to load because what it's doing is it starts caching the live stream to the hard drive and then streaming it back off the hard drive to your Roku. So, does that mean does that mean everything's got a slight delay on it? You're not really watching stuff real time? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, there's, there's nothing live about it. Uh, and there's no channel surfing with this, right? Like, you can't just flip through because you have to go in and out of the Roku menu, first of all, and every time you select a channel, it goes through this caching process and takes a while to load. And it starts streaming video before it's got all the bits. So the first five, ten seconds, it looks like really crappy bitrate stream video, and then it turns into high def and it looks crisp and clear. It's that same effect that you already get with the digital, usually extended cable boxes, where you have a two second lag every time you do it. But it's even more so. It, oh, yeah. it takes oh, yeah. it's already a minor inconvenience that makes it even worse. Absolutely. So uh, then the live TV is in beta. So I, I will give them a pass for some of these problems because they're, I'm getting this thing because I backed their Kickstarter. So I'm getting it av- admittedly before it's done. And, that, right. and I want that. So I'm not, I'm not going to be too hard on them for some of this stuff. But then uh, the, uh, the guide channel stuff is also in beta. And it was okay to find things and put them in. But I kept forgetting what, like, what channels things were on. And over the air in my neighborhood, I don't get all the major broadcast networks with the little antenna I got, right? So that's yeah, not sure. Simple TV's fault, but there was this sort of like, wait a minute, and I know, I know we get this show. Oh, right, that's on NBC, and NBC isn't over the air here yet. Okay, so not perfect for me in, that, in this location, or at least without putting a better antenna on my roof. How um, many channels do you get on the, on the Simple TV? I get about 20 channels, most of which are PBS. Uh, oh, like different variations <laughs> yeah, of them? Yeah, because I get almost every PBS in, like, Northern California somehow I can receive. Like, from San Mateo all the way up to Rohnert Park, I am getting public broadcasting comprehensively. Uh, yeah. I, and then I get, uh, I get Fox, I get the local uh, CBS, and I get uh, Cron, which is an independent channel that used to be NBC, but it's not anymore. It, w- it was NBC back in the 90s. Uh, I do not get NBC or ABC over the air. So uh, at this point, like, are you disappointed? Do you have buyer's remorse? I mean, this is the w- the weird thing. I think in the next couple of years, right now we're in the tail end of this initial euphoria of Kickstarter projects as being essentially you're buying dreams. You're, you're taking old franchises that were dead and buried and resurrecting them or, you know, uh, getting 
certain kinds of games they, they don't think are going to be profitable. But uh, I think over the next year or two, we're all going to feel the sting of backing projects that don't turn out to be what we thought they were going to be. Or we find that uh, in, in some cases, you don't get the thing at all. Like, is this a miss for for Simple TV? Is this a miss for Kickstarter in general? Do you have remorse for having backed this? I, I would not say this is a miss for Kickstarter in any possible way. Uh, I, you know, I backed something and I got what I backed. Uh, the product itself, is it a miss for Simple TV? I don't know. I mean, I have to remember that I decided to back something at, at its beginning and that this, this thing is avowedly, in, in most parts, still in beta and it's only going to get better now that it's released and they have a wide base of people testing it to give them feedback. Uh, they're going to continue to improve things. And they've been very good on Kickstarter. And this is why I say Kickstarter is actually a positive here of communicating with people and saying, this is where we are in the development of it. This is where we are in the development of the Roku app. This is what we know isn't there yet. And this is why we aren't shipping. And when we do ship, these are the things that we know we won't be able to get to you right away, but they will come in future updates. So I'm getting it with a little bit of an expectation that some of the things are not going to be perfect. It was that setup experience that frustrated me the most. I was not expecting the setup to go that poorly. Uh, I do think that they should definitely put in their development plans if they don't already some way to set it up directly from the box because the box has an ethernet connection obviously if their site is down and their setup gets overwhelmed that's a whole separate issue but i also don't know that simple tv is there yet when you have to plug in a hard drive to it it doesn't it's good the next rev is going to have to come with a hard drive if you want the masses to get it uh sure. that's something that they can put in another rev rev rev, rev of it uh I, I think once I start trying it out on laptops and tablets, I might start to see more advantage of it because it works a little bit like a sling box in those situations. Um, I, I so do how, wish I lived in an area that got better television reception, too. As a percentage, how much of your frustration had to do with being slammed on initial release? Because obviously you've got the, all the updates, all the failed installs or whatever. I think all of those are probably related to just one issue but is it that one issue the bulk of what soured you on the experience or is it just one of many things yeah i i would say overall i'm neutral on the experience uh because once i you know once i was watching the nfl for free over the air and able to record it once i set up a couple season passes for shows i could see the brilliance of it uh yeah. and it was just some of that like okay they need to refine their interfaces they need to be able to to move between channels a little faster. Maybe Roku isn't even the best interface for these kinds of things, and that's not exactly Simple TV's issue. They're trying to be in apps in a lot of different places. So if they ever did get, let's say, a, a Google TV app or, a, or a, an Apple TV app or, or a Boxy app, uh, that, that could be like, well, you just need to pick the right device. Or maybe Simple TV's next generation comes with the ability to stream directly from the box to the TV as well as to apps uh, yeah. for accessibility. Overall, though, yeah, I'd say 83% of my frustration was that setup. Interesting. All right. Well, I, I'll be double interested now that that sunk cost of your time and effort is already over with. I'll be interested to see how much better you find the experience from here on out. Well, and here's one of the things. My wife is going to be uh, going down to Los Angeles a lot as part of her new job. She'll be in temporary housing down there. She won't have a cable TV connection necessarily. She can... Net, use this. You can plug in a Roku to a, to a hotel TV and get all of our live channels from back in San Rafael. Wow. Uh, so we'll see how much that ends up being a positive. This is my, my perspective on Simple TV is it's one of those geek things that we've known about. We've, we've experienced this since the 60s where it's like on paper, it can do this. And technically right. it does all of those things it says on paper. But does it do them the way you imagined them and as simply as it possibly could do them? No, it doesn't. Uh, yeah. But but it's early days. This is this is cutting edge, bleeding edge stuff. Yeah. Well, and, and that's the uh, that's that's the the problem, the trade off of getting a work in progress. I mean, you know, think about uh, and you, you see that with Android devices, as I'm sure Jason can attest to on all, all about Android. How many things has Android been able to do for years before finally Apple catches up? But when Apple launches it maps notwithstanding it tends to be very 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 polished so you mentioned something about a youtube experience how does this relate to simple tv it doesn't at all but if you're going to tell a personal story that's related to frame rate i'm going to tell a personal story oh, but this related. is another big story then 
Oh, yeah. There you go. It is right. another big stop. Stop everything. It's another big story. It's really not another big story. It's going to be a very short uh, rant. I got my first ever strike on YouTube on my personal channel. And weirdly, it wasn't uh, like Google was the infractor on it. So uh, I, I have this uh, lecture called Scam Sasquatch and the Supernatural. It's all about uh, psychics and Bigfoot and ESPs and UFOs and so on. And uh, it's a 90-minute presentation that only when I uploaded it five years ago, maybe six years ago, uh, the you could not upload videos over 10 minutes long on YouTube. So it, I uploaded it to many different websites, including Google Video, which allowed the full 90-minute presentation. Uh, and uh, on YouTube, I broke it up into a bunch of 10-minute uh, chunks and put them up as part, you know, one of 14 and so on. And uh, uh, like three or four years ago, the section on ESP... Uh, in context, and to explain a point about cold reading, there's a, uh, I believe, like a 40-second clip of South Park explaining how cold reading works and how John Edward does his trick, uh, you know, in, in the episode called The Biggest Douche in the Universe. And uh, a while back, it got a takedown notice saying Viacom didn't, whatever. And so it's like, okay, whatever, I'm not worried about it. But whenever I wanted to forward people to the full presentation, uh, you know, instead of asking them to buy a DVD or whatever, I'd point them to the Google video posting. But then uh, for a while, like over the last month, I was getting notices saying, Google video, you got stuff up on Google video, you should migrate it over to YouTube. And I'm thinking, I don't want to deal with it because I don't want to deal with the headache because you're just going to have have a, you know, rage fit about this this 40 second clip in a transformative use in an academic lecture. And uh, so I didn't I didn't migrate my stuff over. And this was an intentional decision that I did not want to migrate over my old Google video clips because I did not want to get in trouble for or have to deal with with a takedown notice and have to dispute it. Uh, and in fact, like the weird part was, I guess some timer ran out. Google uploaded as a batch all of the content I had on my Google video account. It automatically uploaded to my YouTube account. So I did not upload. No action whatsoever on my behalf caused this upload to happen. They upload this content. It gets flagged because it's got this 40 second from a Viacom uh, pr product on there. And then they send me a nasty gram saying, your account is being penalized for this. You have a strike against you. And I find myself in the awkward uh, explanation. Uh, and this is where YouTube really, really fails because there is no phone number that you can call to get a person on the line to explain anything to YouTube. That is structurally, that is by design and on purpose because they want stuff that scales, that does stuff on its own. And the human touch is not so much preferred. So I find myself in this awkward Byzantine structure trying to figure out which of these eight radio buttons, all of which do not apply to my situation. There is no radio button that says, you guys uploaded this video, not me. Well, but uh, that's, I actually don't think that's your problem, right? Your problem, you're, 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 it's not a you guys uploaded this thing, not me. Well, because as far what, as, what if it like, happened this way? Google Video never bought YouTube, but Google Video put in all of the policies that YouTube has put in because they went under, under all of the same pressures that Google has been with YouTube, and suddenly you get a takedown notice for your video that's been up for years. It's the same yes. thing. That's yes. what happened. Google didn't yes. upload anything. They said, you know, our Google video brand is going away, so we're going to take all those videos, and we're going to put them under the YouTube brand. So, right. so to me, well, it's, I, your problem isn't that Google video got moved to YouTube. It's that they started to apply the rules of YouTube to that video. Yes. Well, and, and regardless, I mean, if, if uh, I find myself in the awkward situation of having to now defend this under fair use, and I'm pretty sure that it gets covered under fair use. It's a transformative lecture where it's like, you know, nobody's loading up this lecture to watch this clip. They're what they're it's doing. Also it it's also educational. Yes, a, it's exactly. It's an instructive educational. purpose. Not That's another profit. defense. I'm not making any money on it. I mean, it, I, I think there's a number of defenses to be made, but I don't want to make any of these defenses. And I didn't want the strike against my record to begin with. And I hate that I've been I've been thrust yeah, in but, this situation. But if you say this is fair use because because it's educational, because it's transformative, they will and, and they accept that it, it takes the strike off your record. You have to respond or your strike stays. 
Yes. Well, and so I did respond. And so I, I clicked on fair use and it's been uh, like five days now and they haven't responded. So see, I'll, that's, I'll see that's the part of your story that I get 100 percent behind, which is all they, they've got all of this crap that now they've tied closer to the DMCA. But it's really just internal rules for the most part. And there's no way for the person who isn't infringing to fight back if the robot thinks they are. Yes. Well, and I find myself like I've done the most I could possibly do, except for get on a public platform and start shouting at YouTube, which I am definitely, definitely doing right now. Or unless you knew somebody, like if you had an internal contact of some sort. And that's not the way it should work. You shouldn't have to be a podcaster with a large audience or know somebody to get this stuff. There should be a path to say, I need to talk to somebody because I'm not a pirate. <laughs> you know, I have a legitimate reason for using this copyrighted material that is perfectly legal. Why is there not like a disclosure upon upload where you, why does it always have to be like they discovered you doing something bad? Why can't it be as you upload, say, hey, heads up, these are the clips in there that you're probably going to have a problem with. These are the reasons in advance why they're in there. Please do not take it down. And especially for news content like we're doing here at Twit, it's ridiculous that they take that they they take away the one thing that Twit really does have as an advantage, which is first mover, uh, time sensitive right. content. And when you take away the time sensitivity, when you block out the window uh, for the time that this content most has the chance to become popular, that that is that is substantial harm you're doing to the content producers. Do now you have filed the counter notice? Has your video been restored? No, I mean, it's, it's just marked as private and there's no... And again, there's... That's, that's, that's the problem is the way it's supposed to work is when you file the counter. And this is why YouTube's saying like, look, we, gave you, we give you an avenue to say this is fair use and it goes back up when you say it's fair use unless the other person says, no, it really isn't. So I don't know right. why it's not going up. I mean, well, the process it, 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 is supposed to be automatic so that you can immediately respond. I'll tell you what, let me right now actually go to the video manager and see if I can uh, actually add... The video because it's it's there just marked as private and I wonder if I now because I filed a, a counterclaim can redo it but of course that just ups the stakes even more so so now it's like I'm on purpose after having been notified find myself uh, uh, you know having to go to you know on on purpose in public say I'm going to take you on on this here we go so let's see we've got here's this video right here I'll go to edit. Uh, I guess it says video blocked in some countries. It uh -huh. says, yeah, that, but, no, that's not good. So and what? That, uh, you, uh, haven't, you haven't been cleared yet for some okay. reason. See, when Tech News Today got taken down the first time through, and, and they hadn't changed the policy yet, so maybe they've changed how this works, but the first time through, it actually went up pretty quickly. When, do, when so did you file the counter notice? Uh, like four days ago. Oh, yeah. So no, it should have yeah, definitely. I'm going to try to change it to public, and we'll see. If I save changes, huh, I don't know. Uh, take a look and see if you guys are able to find Scam Sasquatch and the Supernatural full lecture. That'll be interesting. I'll jump this on and see if that actually says live clips. This is the pieces of it that are on here. So I don't know. This video is a duplicate of a previously uploaded video. What? Maybe I'm uh, on the wrong link. Well, I don't know. Maybe. That, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know. Hmm. We'll see. All right. Well, I mean... There's always weirdnesses and, and strange particular conditions that involve every case. And that's the problem with the algorithm. Somebody in the chat room said it right. It presumes you're guilty. Yes. It's guilty until proven innocent. And, and what you're asking for, Brian, is innocence until proven guilt. Uh, that's a crazy idea. It's never going to happen, Tom. Nah, not, not in the medieval world of... Uh, of privately run companies here i just posted the link in the chat you guys could tell me if it's visible now because maybe maybe that's the the new implementation of the rule where it uh, uh like now i'm allowed to make it public on my own i doubt Same that it works but... so yeah there's that yep it works for me now right there on you go. all right well it's, it's, I'm not well, i don't know why it says blocked in some countries though it shouldn't be blocked in any countries yeah, it said it was blocked in Germany for some reason. I don't know what the story with that is. Uh, oh, maybe uh, because, you know, you're controversial in Germany. Uh, it could be. Uh, it may be that the, like, I think the intro music clip, uh, which, again, shouldn't have been a problem if you if you just put an ad on there. I think there are some company, countries where they never they never do it. Anyway, that's, that's, that's what I'm dealing with. Let's uh, move on to yet another big story. 
Tuck in your bootstraps. It's yet another big story. Uh, Netflix had their earnings last week. Uh, Big swings in the stock price. Uh, Q3 domestic subscription numbers fell below investors' expectations, but they are growing. What I found most interesting in all of this was this quote from Reed Hastings. We think it will make strategic sense eventually for HBO to go direct to consumer in the United (laughs) States and become more of a competitor to Netflix. So that is our operating assumption. Yeah, man. So this is saying that smart money that has a moneyed interest in in defending their own turf, they say, I don't care what HBO is saying publicly. It's obvious to us that this is a move that makes sense for HBO and we are preparing to defend against it. Now, yeah, I guess that's why Breed Hastings is saying this, to let the market know, look, we're, we're taking action already. So don't worry about us. I mean, we know Amazon's uh, numbers are building. We know Hulu's on our tail, but we're fending them off, and we're going to fend off HBO too. I still don't. I don't quite understand why he would bring it up, though, because I don't think anybody else is talking about HBO going after Netflix. They're all talking about how HBO should go after Netflix, but won't. Well, but part of the reason they have these calls is so that they can set investor expectations. And I would assume that part of that means like, look, we've enjoyed a monopoly up until now, but now we are seeing significant players, including an 800 pound gorilla by the name of HBO coming on in. So it makes sense to me that he would want to disclose all of this to investors if uh, what he's worried about, you know, if, if it's a known factor that they're attempting to deal with preemptively, that seems like something they should put out there. But it seems like a lose lose. Right. If, if, if HBO doesn't come after him soon, then the investors go, well, what's your excuse now? You, you were talking about HBO a few quarters ago and that never happened. You were distracted right. by something that wasn't real. If HBO right. does come after him, then it's sort of like, well, you knew this. You said quarters ago that HBO was going to come after. What? Why haven't you done better? It's almost like you're setting yourself up for a disappointment in any case that happens. Uh, maybe it's maybe it's a tactic where all he wants to do is to distract from what he's saying by throwing gasoline on a nearby fire. Like, hey, look out! Here's a HBO is freaking out. Hey, everybody, HBO. Yeah, uh, don't you? Hey, whoa, HBO! Did you see that? They totally <laughs> went to Scandinavia. They're coming for us next. Well, and you know what? Actually, that, that I hadn't thought about that, but they are fighting HBO on multiple theaters of operation. Uh, you know, Netflix would like to expand into these other arenas, too. So if HBO is doing uh, an on-demand online service in Scandinavia and Netflix is targeting Scandinavia at some point, uh, yeah, or I think they are in, in Scandinavia, yeah. actually. No, 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 they already so, are. So they're, yeah. doing, they're doing head-to-head battle there already. I mean, think about this. Like, if, if they truly are playing a, go, a global game of chess, uh, the U.S. market and their position there is a small piece of the overall puzzle. And I think it's worth it where they are already, there are already battlegrounds that they're losing in Scandinavia. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, let's take a, a moment to tell the fine folks at home about MailRoute, Brian. Have you heard about MailRoute? Oh, my Mail gosh. MailRoute, are you kidding was my roommate in college. It was a golden four years. Me and MailRoute, we used to order pizzas together. And what I loved about MailRoute, bruiser. MailRoute, every time somebody would show up with a Hawaiian pizza with spam on it, he'd clock them right in the face and say, Is, is that right? Spam. Is that the roots of MailRoute's, like, no spam policy? I mean, assuming it's the same guy, Larry MailRoute, right? Yeah, Larry Mailroute. Well, he just goes by Mailroute now. Uh, okay. And he's gone from being your college roommate to becoming a 24-7 enterprise service for mail where you just uh, make a, a little domain name change and all your mail is routed through him. He removes the spam and then sends you only the mail that's good. Oh, man, I'm so glad because he used to talk about back in college. That was his dream. He said, one day, Brian, I'm going to cease to be a corporeal form. Instead, I will become a dream for enterprise operations who want to cleanse their email of all kinds of spam. And I'll never have a false positive, Brian. I said, never. I said, and he said, if Tom Merritt says if ever has a false positive, you can punch me in the nose in my virtual face. Well, let me just tell you, you have no right to punch him in the nose on my my account yet. Oh, well, dude. Yeah. So how great is MailRoute? If only we could get this product at a discount for frame rate viewers. Right. Now, some of you may be saying, sure, if I'm Brian Brushwood, if I'm well connected and had high powerful roommates in college, I could take advantage of MailRoute. But that's not me. Well, my friend, that's where you're wrong. 
you are Brian Brushwood, and you are in college, and you're rooming with MailRoute for free right now. All you have to do to make it happen is go to MailRoute.net, click the sign-up button, and enter the promo code FRAMERATE to start your 15-day free trial and get 10% off for the life of your account. No Amazing. credit card required for the free trial. That's MailRoute.net. Click the sign-up button and enter the promo code Frame rate, and just make sure don't order any pizza with spam. Yeah, because they'll just take it off. <laughs> that's and that's a nice thing. He used to punch the pizza guy. Now he just gives you the pizza, but uh, just the spam is gone. It's it's all just a uh, uh, pineapple on there. And you know, if you get lonely, uh, especially because there's there's you need to have a customer support question. Twenty four hours, seven days a week. Call him; he'll call you back within the hour. He still returns my phone calls. Yeah, mail around. He'll do that for that's everybody. Let's move into the slipstream. TechCrunch has a story about uh, YouTube uh, testing out new layouts of their pages that are starting to solve one of my biggest problems, which is how do you find the stuff in these new channels that YouTube has out there? Uh, and it's, it's laying out the channels that you subscribe in the left-hand nav a little nicer and make it making it easier to go through those videos in your channels. Yeah, dude. I And again, we can't say this enough. This is one of those things that you read about it and you're like, oh, wait, there's a whole article about somebody moved an icon from the left side or the right side or whatever. But these things matter, man. That's the lesson I took from Apple is is human interaction and ease of navigation are, are paramount for that user experience, especially in nowadays when everything's chaotic, you got 18 billion different places to look and so much competing for your attention. You want the guided experience as simple as possible. Now, apparently these are very small scale tests. Only a few people in the world are seeing them. And Google uh, has not said we don't comment on rumors or speculation. They've said uh, with more videos coming to YouTube every minute, we're always experimenting with ways to help people more easily find, watch, and share videos. We'll consider rolling changes out more broadly based on feedback on these experiments. So they said, yeah, we do experiments all the time, and we find out what people like in them and what they don't. And then if we find stuff that works, we roll it out more broadly. So. And I think this is, a, this is a very Google way to handle the problem, too, is, is to set up yeah. – a statistically significant sample size and to just see what happens. And then the more positive responses you get, scale it up to everyone. Verizon is expanding its quad play deal with Time Warner Cable and Cox. Uh, we, we talked about this coming for a while, but essentially when you order cable service from Time Warner or Cox Communications, uh, you can throw in Verizon Wireless. This is part of that Spectrum deal where Verizon got to buy a bunch of Spectrum, and one of the things that was added into that deal was the ability for the cable companies to sell you cell phone service when you call them to hook up your cable. So that's why it's called Quad Play, because you sign up your home phone, your internet, your cable TV, and your cell phone service all at once. This is a very weird deal to me, and I don't know, this is not based on any kind of legitimate thoughtfulness on my part, but it just feels like everything about this deal smacks of uh not really interested in the consumers at all this was this was a handshake deal saying let us buy the spectrum and we'll you send a bunch of our chump consumers over your way is what it felt like to me i don't know well uh, cox and and time warner both tried to do some wireless of their own uh i believe time warner was partnering with clear for a while or for with sprint they all want to do this they all want to offer mobile comcast has been doing this in certain markets for a while uh, and so I think what they decided was instead of trying to roll our own and use our spectrum, we're, we're going to just divest that to somebody who's good at it. Uh, yeah, for a kickback, part, basically, partner right? up with them. Yeah, exactly. What I don't like about it, because I, I think that is all fine. That actually makes sense. The people who are good at wireless should do the wireless. What I don't like is that it might dissuade Verizon from competing with them on Internet. Uh, as you know, Verizon paused the rollout oh, of Fios. Gosh. They're not rolling it out to any new places. And now they're in business with people who have, a, have an interest in dissuading them from continuing to roll out faster internet. Yeah, I would love, love, love if uh, the Fios ever came to Austin. I'm really bummed that I don't seem to have much of a choice. Now, this seems to be to be a net neutrality violation, this net story. Everything Everywhere is the LTE provider, fast wireless service in the UK. They are bundling in an EE film service that allows you to download or stream one free movie each week that is zero rated from your data usage. Uh, and you can do additional titles uh, at 79 pence each, uh, each film. 
And I don't know if those don't count or not, but I, they're I essentially imagine, saying uh, use us, not Netflix or Love Film, folks, because it won't count against your data cap. It absolutely is a net neutrality issue. There's no question about it. And it does a good job of highlighting the biggest problem is uh, Netflix's value is an enormous amount of content streamed, uh, all you can eat. But it fundamentally changes when you have to pay for the bandwidth to get it. And it's like, uh, like I'm amazed at how much, like I bought an iPad with, with LTE coverage and, uh, of course, the obvious use is to watch high-quality video, but I'm terrified that one of my kids will pick it up and start acting, you know, as they always do, like, oh, I'm going to turn on Netflix. And then, you know, three hours later, my entire bandwidth cap is exceeded. You know, Windows Phone, in their announcement today, highlighted exactly those problems. It was like they were speaking to you because they had two features they added. One, data sense uh, keeps you from going over your bandwidth limit. By, right. by trying to reduce the amount of, of data that you use, but also letting you see how much you have used in, in your apps like Netflix. And the other is the Kids Center, where you can actually create certain apps that only, the kids can only get to those apps and nothing else. So that when off the lock screen, they swipe into there and they can't accidentally open anything else. Can you set it up like conditionally, like they can use Netflix, but only if I'm connected to Wi-Fi? Uh, you know, they didn't talk about that. That would be a good feature to add. I don't know if that's in there, but I, I don't think it was, or they, they probably would have played that up. Interesting. We got this. Uh, do you remember who tipped us off to Ku? Oh, uh, wait a minute. Before we get to that, uh, Amazon Instant, now available on Samsung TVs. If you're into smart TVs, I think Samsung is now crushing everybody with availability because they have everything. It's built into everything. Yeah, yeah, they've got YouTube, they've got Hulu, they've got Netflix, they've got MLB, and now they've got Amazon Instant, so... They, they've got all the majors. Uh, By but, the way, uh, Amazon Instant got me, finally. I went ahead and signed up for it. Oh, really? Uh, Amazon Prime. I'm going to poke around and try that out. You know, Reed Hastings talked about that in that earnings call, too. He said, uh, Amazon Instant has not yet passed Hulu Plus. In the past, he said, Hulu and Amazon aren't a threat. So Peter right. Kafka at All Things D pointed out that's a... It's an interesting change in phrasing there. Sure, sure, especially from somebody who's traditionally very careful with his words. Uh, but I can't remember who passed along Coup d'Etat. It's an Indiegogo uh, uh, project. Indiegogo is like Kickstarter. If they get funded, they'll, they'll do the project. But they say they're going to do a la carte cable. Yes. Well, and, and if you look at the video on there, it just flatly makes the claim. Uh, and, and this is a curious this is a curious thing. This came in over over uh, the email. Somebody sent it in a frame rate at twit.tv. TV. Uh, and basically, there's a cute animation that says, hey, is it doesn't it suck to buy all you can eat cable? Wouldn't you love to just pay for the services you want a la carte? It's only been the dream of everybody. And we're just going to promise it to you. All we need is $150,000. And when you scroll down to see what the money's used for, it says pretty much um, uh, for, for legal defense. That's, that's right, right? Yeah, uh, first thing I, they might get sued for is using all those logos without permission in their sure. Indiegogo uh, kickoff. They've got the logos of every major channel, somewhat implying that those would be available. They, they do clearly state we don't have any partnerships with anybody yet. And that's why right. I think I, I don't know who's behind this. I did I didn't do a lot of searching, but I did do some minimal searches to try to find any corporate information. There's nothing about the the staff or the corporate uh, s structure at the actual coup d'état site. The only information I could find on it was a CNET article from Rick Broida, who's just referencing the Indiegogo site. Uh, so I don't know who's behind this. Or, or what kind of backing they might have. They say they have a combined 50 years experience in television. Frankly, that doesn't sound like a lot, even if it's only two or three people. Uh, yes. It's just not confidence inspiring to me that these By folks the way, can pull it off. It seems like they're trying to get $150,000 on a wish and a dream. It was Tony Nolan who sent this in. Thank you very much, Tony. And, uh, and yeah, it basically, and here's the weird part is, even if, all they're really saying is, is give us a lot of money and we'll go to bat for this. I'm still kind of behind that because, I mean, if I had stupid money floating around, I'd love to throw some money at some people to hire a lawyer and stir stuff up. But this just doesn't seem as a well-coordinated effort as we've seen, for, for for example, from the folks at Aereo, where you have a very spe specific domain that you want to tackle uh, in the law can be on your side. This just looks really really mushy as yeah. it is right now. no i i would not put i would not put my money into this personally 
Uh, there's, a, there's just not enough there there. When you have companies like Aereo TV backed by somebody like Barry Diller who have taken very cautious approach to streaming live TV over the Internet and they are getting hammered by the industry, who knows him? This guy has more than 50 years of experience in the broadcast industry alone. Uh, I don't think that these guys have a, have a prayer at going up against this industry. Well, yeah. I'm happy to be proven wrong if, they, if that happens, but I'm not seeing any convincing evidence on this. Agreed. Let's move on to the tube top. I love this. Roku has added universal search so that you can just look for an artist, uh, a, an actor, or a movie in one search box, and it will search across multiple apps like Amazon, Netflix, Hulu Plus, Crackle, Vudu, and HBO and tell you, oh, you want to watch Office Space? It's available on this service. Would you like to launch that app and watch it now? Yes, 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 a million times yes. This is exactly the kind of simplification that we've been calling for. So it's exciting to see uh, these first steps coming in. Yeah, that's on the Roku. So uh, if you don't get the uh, update soon and you want to rush it, just go into settings and say, you know, update my software, search for an update, and it will come with this most recent update. Also, Boxy apparently offering free Boxy TVs to people who have signed up for their notifications. If you expressed interest in the new Boxy TV box, which we've talked about before, some people are reporting they've gotten an email saying, hey, we'd like to give you a free box to try out. Yeah, that's uh, that's really weird because it's like the, the exact people who would be receiving the free box are already champions of Boxy. I wonder what their play is with this outside of maybe just to do it. Maybe they have a lot of goodwill and they just want to preserve as much of that goodwill as possible. I, I like, think it's a beta test. I think they're basically saying, look, we want to take the people who are champions and make them our marketing team and our right. testing team. So, A, they let us know what they love and don't love about the box. And these are the people who love it the most. So if they don't love something, we need to fix that. And B, they start going and telling everybody else about how awesome their boxy TV is. Yeah, and because they're not paying for it, it is amazing how much easier it is to champion something even flawed as long as you've been given it for free. They also have to fill out a survey, so they're, they're selling a little bit of their data to get it as well. I was interested in this editorial from Engadget. I don't know what you thought about it. Ben Gilbert writing up about Xbox Smart Glass, which is the app that allows you to control your Xbox from a second screen on, on a tablet. And he says... He's not even a sports fan, but the NBA game time uh, function here, he thought, was, was the killer thing for the second screen. And we've talked a lot about how we don't see the compelling use for a second screen, but he said being able to see what's going on across multiple games, even while you're watching one game up on the top, and being able to make predictions and swap notes with your friends who are also into the sport and watching games, he found it really compelling. Uh, yeah, and I, I don't know how much of the article is uh, somebody who is just outside of sports reacting to the novelty of what they have available in this in this in this whole package. Um, but uh, I mean, if anything, I think Xbox is a natural fit for this kind of thing, because the type of people who are into sports are going to be the type of people who also play, you know, the sports franchises on the Xbox. I think the Xbox is a great undervalued, underused uh, uh, cord cutters device because it's a uh, it's it's got plenty of horsepower behind it to do and they've got the agreements that can make this kind of thing possible so i think it's smart for them to focus so hard on this one targeted market and uh, uh i look forward to checking it out myself even though i'm not a sports guy yahoo has signed a content deal with cbs to bring original video from the insider one of their entertainment programs to Yahoo's website called OMG, which is a similar kind of content coverage. And two of the hosts of the videos on OMG will be joining the staff of The Insider to contribute reports. Now, hold on, Tom. If I'm not mistaken, this sounds like a film film story. You would not be mistaken, Brian, because it is our first film film story. Do you like that safe? That's a good no safe. Idea. Thank you. In case it would be there for me. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, these are two uh, franchises that I would never be caught looking at. So I'm interested yeah. to see. <laughs> well, yeah, I know. It's not my kind of my cup of tea either. But the idea that television, uh, and this is the first time Yahoo has done this, actually. They partnered with ABC News. But a television network saying, yeah, we'll take our very valuable TV content and use it even if it's not f full episodes, but cut it up and put it on your little website. And in return, 
you get to have like your talent from your website join. They're essentially merging the content property here. Well, I think this is a kind of a preemptive strike. You saw that uh, in this market, you had uh, TMZ, of course, was the massive crossover success that started off as an up-to-the-minute gossip website that became a popular television show. Uh, This is a way to take two existing brands, one with a television background, one with a web background, and create something new that uh, I'm using air quotes for our audio uh, that, and, uh, <laughs> and, and, and I think it's interesting, too, that they're not just saying, we'll take the insider and put it up on our website and host full episodes. That's what AOL did with AOL Video for a long time. What they're saying is, we actually want to make both properties better and partner up. And we're going to take the hosts of the Yo! show, Michael Yo! and Yahoo's Kristen Aldridge of the OMG Now! show and put them on the insider. And we're going to change the name of OMG to OMG The Insider or OMG Insider. Yeah. Or OMG yeah, I, I think this is a really good – if you got two established brands and, the, and, and you want to bridge that gap and you want to take on another uh, multi-platform institution like TMZ, I think this is a very good solution. Also, the 10th anniversary special Firefly Brown Coats Unite is coming to Discovery's Science Channel on November 11th at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. Uh, so uh, this is uh, based on the reunion panel that was held at Comic-Con – this past summer, but there's also a lot of bonus interview content, things that were done behind the scenes that even if you've seen the panel, say on YouTube, or if you were there in person, you won't have seen all of it. Uh, so so brown coats uh, are going to be excited about this. I know I am ex- excited about it. Science Channel, November 11th, 10 p.m. Eastern and Pacific. Check your local listings for showtimes. Yeah. You're, you're wearing a blue sun. You know what? I, I am wearing a blue sun. In fact, I'm working on a movie. It's, it's the untold story of the rise of the Blue Sun Corporation. And it begins Do you with need this... Joss Whedon's permission to use that name? Um, uh, luckily, it's, uh, it's, it's, the, it's the, the Cobalt Star Corporation. Oh, right. My... Okay, the Cobalt Star yeah, Corporation. Right, okay. Yeah. yeah, it's called Cobalt Star. And it's the rise of a young businessman who uh, has, like, crazy spiky hair uh, and, uh, and, like, a few superpowers like he can eat fire kind of and a john galt skates. meets a magician yes exactly but here's the thing i i don't i ain't got the budget to travel to to singapore where like a bunch of this stuff happens and uh and ducks oh so you just need some some backgrounds from singapore you, you think because yeah, i know yeah, a place no, but the problem is i don't know anybody i know there. i know a guy i actually it's not a guy it's a website in fact it's not a website it's a sponsor Pond5, P-O-N-D5.com. You can get, look at this, 5,686 stock photos, 2,036 clips of stock video, all of Singapore. That help yeah, you out? I, I got to get their permission to put it, because I'm no, going to make a these are These are royalty-free. What? Uh, once, once you pay for the download, it's, you, it, it's legal in almost every case. <laughs> That's amazing, dude. Well, that's see, yeah. and that's weird too because like I'm sitting on tons of footage of cockroaches. Like I've oh, lately, you know, they have I, they have cockroaches there, but you know what? They always take more. They'll actually take your video and allow you to sell it and give you top rates and royalties. Wait a minute, yeah, I can I can make money on on pictures of bugs. You can. This is the greatest website of all time. And you know what makes it even greater? This month you can get 15% off your purchase of cockroach videos or anything else. Am I hearing roach sounds? Using frame rate 10. That's pond5.com. Use the code frame rate 10 on the checkout page. That's the promo code. And uh, you probably shouldn't show cockroaches because that's going to creep a lot of people out. But (laughs) But you can find ducks on Pond5. You could find pretty cute mallard ducks swimming around, and you can get I'm 15% terrified. off when you use frame rate 10. You could add the ducks to Singapore, and you got your movie. There you go. Cobalt ducks Store. In Singapore, the Cobalt Star Corporation story. A ducks story. Uh, okay, so I, I just accidentally closed the dock. What do we do next? That's all right. Let's talk about the NSFW show, Draft. we have to yes uh, that's it i'm out i'm calling it i got nothing my whole strategy was to play the field i wanted to buy as many wild cards as possible and figure one of them would uh, would would pan out and none of them has cloud atlas opened to a lousy nine million dollars i i don't even know what to say wow silent yeah. hill only got eight million dollars cloud atlas actually outdrew it 
And I'm, my Alex Cross is up to 19 million. It's it's Not bad. disgusting. I I'm I, I the good news the only good news left for me is that uh, Wreck It Ralph will at least move me into respectable. Oh, yeah, territory. you've got Wreck It Ralph this weekend. This is this yeah. is kind of your premier title, isn't it? Okay, uh, yes, Wreck It Ralph and Lincoln. But there's no way. I, it's like in order to compete, Wreck It Ralph would have to make 300 million, and Lincoln would have to make like 150. Doesn't 200. Lincoln get assassinated? Uh, yeah. Spoiler alerts. He's gonna drop that. <laughs> uh, yeah, so yeah, Wreck It Ralph out this weekend and Flight out this weekend. That's just a Robert Young's movie. I am I am optimistic though. I've seen a hell of a lot of promotion for Wreck It Ralph and the re- and the returns seem to be the early reviews seem to be overwhelmingly positive. So there was a we'll lot s- of promotion for Cloud Atlas too. And uh, yeah, <laughs> but you know what? You know what the problem with the, here's the thing: Wreck It Ralph is going to get better distribution. Cloud Atlas was only playing three times on Friday and in an art theater. Not an art theater, but one of those cine arts type theaters, not in the like Northgate 20 cineplex. So it, it, it didn't get as many showings. Uh, and that's, that's, I guess, the side effect of it being so long. But the other thing that I don't think many of us factored into our purchases is that unlike the summer draft, where the sweet spot is right around late June, early July, uh, the, the number and popularity of movies gets higher and higher once you get past October and you get into late November and, and the Christmas rush. So yeah. I, I think the fact that you've got these later movies, you know, Skyfall is going to be huge and uh, uh, the, the Hobbit will be huge. But uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm pissed and I'm out. I'm done. I'm Skyfall's not out for divorced. a couple of weeks. Uh, Skyfall up against Lincoln is bad news for you. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Wait, you don't think people would rather see an old dead president instead of James Bond? I think they should mash those up. Did you see the video that the editor did where he, he pits different James Bonds against each other by editing their, their like, respective uh, chase scenes? So oh, they're, like, shooting awesome. at each other. Or Sean Connery shoots down Roger Moore from a plane. That sounds epic yeah. and, like, takedown bait. Yeah, totally. Go to Boing Boing. They've got it up there. All right, I'll find uh, it. Shall we move on to what we're watching? watching i watched cloud atlas since we were just talking about it how was it it was almost amazing god dang it that was what that was what that's that's what eileen said because we were going back and forth having this long conversation of how we wanted to like it more than we did and what the problems were with it and she's like yeah it was almost amazing i'm like that's it that is exact that's the tagline for me well, right there the, uh, the other way i've heard it described is uh you know it was an epic long trailer for a movie that was essentially an epically long trailer for a book that, that, that you're probably not going to get around to read. I, I read the book before going in. My wife did not read the book before going in to see it. We both had exactly the same reaction. So, I mean, that's not scientific or anything, but it certainly wasn't only because I had read the book. And I thought the way they handled the multiple stories in the book was very good and very clever. Because if they had just followed the book, which tells a story and then interrupts it and then tells another story and then interrupts it, I think that would have been really boring. It still yeah. dragged at parts, but when they got to the end and they started to crescendo and they started to resolve these, these stories with their emotional uh, impacts and they started to tie them together, I started to tear up. I started to really get like, okay, even though it lagged a little, this, they're bringing it home. I'm loving it. And then they wrapped up the Slusha's Crossing story, uh, which is the, the farthest one in the future. And it was just a pat, to me, it felt like, a pat ending. It was different than the ending in the book, uh, which I felt was much more powerful. And it just let me down. And I was, all the wind was taken out of my sails. Yeah, oh, what a bummer. Man, I wanted it to be so good. And, and I'm terrible. Like, the moment I hear one negative review, I won't bother. Like, I'm always so risk adverse when it comes to my entertainment especially movies if i'm gonna invest two or in this case three hours in something i only want to do it if i'm certain it's going to be amazing and hearing that just takes all the wind out of my sails what a bummer but what i can be positive about is haven oh Hit, yeah killing it in this in this season uh so if you're if you're not watching haven j- jump in don't even worry about catching up on the story arc there is a story arc uh but it is it's based on a stephen king 
uh, novel. And so you can go back and pick up the rest of the story later. Uh, start from the beginning of this season and, I, and or even pick up just the ep- end of episode last season so you get that kind of cliffhanger thing going across the, the two seasons. I think they're having their best season yet. And it's actually tying closer and closer into the Colorado Kids story than it did in those first couple seasons. Uh, well, do you know what you could have exactly been talking about just then was The Walking Dead, which uh, will stay spoiler-free right here. We'll talk about it in the spoiler zone. But they're killing it because they're getting closer and closer back to the original comic book. Are you, and they're I mean, literally killing it more uh, yes, more often. And, and then killing it twice. They kill it, <laughs> and then they wait a few minutes to make sure it's not going to stir, and then they kill it again just to be sure. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so we'll definitely talk about it in the spoiler zone. But uh, Always Sunny in Philadelphia is back. Yeah. New cast, right? Uh, yeah, what's that? New cast or a cast update or something? No, well, I mean that was the fake. That was the fake lie oh, that, that they a, sold okay, everything right. on. That was all a big, a big joke. Uh, was that they were pretending that there was a new cast? But uh, w- weirdly, I I keep hoping the episodes will be better than they are, and I don't know. You know, Always Sunny in Philadelphia is at its strongest when you just turn it on and you don't expect anything and it just really surprises you. And the problem is it's been so long and I'm so excited to have it back that I think I'm overhyping it myself. Uh, This last one, uh, or the one with the garbage men, was, uh, I thought, probably the best of the new season. Uh, And I got caught up on Sons of Anarchy, which uh, also has been so good. I mean, I thought it was pretty good the first two seasons or so. But then there's a, a reset that happens at, at the end of, uh, I want to say, season two. And so you begin at season three, and it's sort of a reset. Uh, everything since then, I think, has been really amazing. And, of course, watch Walking Dead, not only am I continuing to watch it and loving it, but my wife, who uh, is pregnant right now and uh, and understandably not so interested in watching themes of death or themes of a pregnant woman in dire apocalyptic circumstances— uh, she, uh, I tricked her into just watching the beginning and she ended up watching the whole thing and she's read the comic books and, and really seems to be on board as well. So, uh, I, I, I just want to, uh, say that while we're recording this, there's a lot of hurricane news coming through. A lot of people saying things in the chat room, uh, about really awful things as the, as the landfall happens. I'm keeping an eye out of it. When I see confirmation about it, we will talk about that. Of course, you, and those of you watching on demand already know everything. Uh, that happened there. Uh, this is kind of bring everything down. We're yeah, talking. I know. Well, I got distracted now, uh, like, yeah. looking up. Some people were making some claims in the chat room that I haven't been able to confirm. So uh, let's look at the feedback. Now it's time for feedback with Brian and Tom on Flame Radio. Yeah. Our first piece of feedback comes from uh, who is this? Eric. Eric. Hey, thanks, Eric. Uh, he says, as of October 24th, I am an official cord cutter. Congratulations. Ooh, you're a better man than me and Brian. My wife and I decided to cancel our DirecTV subscription and go with just our Roku, augmented by whatever free over-the-air channels we receive. I spent a lot of time researching antennas. When one evening, while looking through the junk in my garage, I came across an old VHF antenna I had saved many years ago. I climbed up on the roof, disconnected the coax from the DirecTV dish, connected it to the VHF antenna, and masterfully attached it to the now-functional dish with duct tape. Check that out. Well done. That, that looks uh, classy. If I was your neighbor, I most certainly would not be calling the Homeowners Association <laughs> about that shabby Reception job. is perfect. I get all 18 local channels that Antenna Web says I should. Uh, being a scrounger and saver of old crap, I couldn't be more pleased. My new antenna is shown in attached photos. That's the ones we're showing. And I plan to attach it more permanently in the future as soon as Brian gets the Homeowners Association on you, probably. Uh, That's right. So far, I don't miss direct TV. We had found over the last couple of years that the vast majority of our TV viewing was through the Roku anyway. Regular TV shows that we did watch or DVR were just from a few channels that we now get for free from the antenna. I do plan to add a DVR in the loop at some point, but I can do that any time. Uh, Story yes. of a cord cutter. Well done, Eric. And by the way, this was an exceptional week. We got a lot of feedback, and I want to get through as much of it as we can. I apologize if we if we don't get to your letter, but uh, this one from Barry Neal brings up an interesting point about spoiler rules. He says, Tom, 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 in a disappointing voice. Longtime fan, short-time credit. I was extremely disappointed on how cavalierly you dropped several major spoilers to the Argo movie. I intended on going to see this movie, and possibly to your surprise, I didn't know the story of Argo. For you to declare that their attempts would be successful, 
Fuller, not even to the point of describing the final scene of the movie, showed an indifference to your audience. I hope the movie drafts, of which I'm a willing participant, has not caused you to look at movies as only millions of dollars per... Okay, whatever. He, he kind of gets on your junk for that. Um, I was truly shocked and disappointed. It is okay, though. Still a huge fan of the Twit TV Nation. But as I tell my qu- kids, when you know better, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so I sent... I guess, essentially... In the great rules of spoilage accord of 1705, was there a mention of when a movie is historically based, but it's a lesser known historical story? Because obviously for big things, if you're going to do a movie about Lincoln, you know, he gets shot at the end. Uh, spoiler alert. Right? I, I, so- I, here's, here's my take. I don't care if it's lesser or well or not, not lesser known. If it's history that is known then you can't spoil it because then you could say, I would like to talk about the Iran hostage crisis of 1979 on my totally not movie related podcast. And people would, no, that's a spoiler because I haven't seen Argo yet. That's just ridiculous. Uh, no, no. Okay. Okay. All right. Let me, let me flip it for you. If, if your argument is that as long as something is part of the historical record, then it's fair game. And it doesn't matter if you ru- ruin someone's personal experience by that logic, then when something exists as a book or a comic book and is joining a new medium, all of a sudden it's like, well, it's already it's already been out. We're already up to episode 78 of The Walking Dead. I'll tell you who dies. Like, is that suddenly fair game? Because no, I, I, does I, the translation of a story from one medium to another protect it? That's, that's not history. That's not historical events. That's, I, you're mean, just, you're, I mean, I, the fact that I read a book is not a historical event. All it right. is. It is. But we it's do. Out, we do need to have a fair stories. definition of a historical event. But I think the Iran hostage crisis counts. I think um, that's safely in the history category, not the somebody read the Walking Dead category. You know what? Weird. I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think I think I'm on his side. I'm, I think I think that I personally would not have known how that movie ends, and I don't know the fact that it's based on a historical story. I think people are way too sensitive to spoilers these days. I think that knowing things about the movie doesn't ruin the experience nearly as much as people are afraid of and get so sensitive about. And in fact, if you're that sensitive, you should never watch any entertainment-oriented show because they're going to spoil things all the time. And so so if you can't talk about... I mean, I knew what happened in Argo, I was watching it, and my point was that I was still tense up until the end, even though I knew. That's the whole point. Okay, but last question on this. What about, uh, so and does that mean any movie that says based on a true story? Uh, does that mean like like uh, the hurricane or whatever well, that now, was? No, I said historic, was? I'm talking historical events, and I'll agree that we do need to have a definition of a historical event. Uh, but based on a true story could be somebody's personal story that only 12 people know about. And that's not a historical event yet. If it's like Brian's trip, you know, to camp when he was 10, that's not a historical event. That's uh, different. I don't know. I'm just saying you need to show a little more sensitivity because I think think you did inadvertently take something away from Barry. And I think you should apologize. I, 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 I understand Barry's perspective because he didn't know the story and he feels like the... I, I, would, li- I would challenge Barry to go watch the movie and see if it really does ruin his experience. Interesting. In the All meantime, right. you know, get provisionally, I apologize for, for ruining <laughs> your movie. Provisional apology. Yeah. That's, that's as good as you get from but Barry. You go, go watch the movie and then you tell me if I need to make that a, a firm apology. It's because, it's, I mean, to be honest, it's never my intention to spoil. I honestly am like, look, it's Lincoln. I'm going to tell you, we know what happens to Lincoln, right? You know, you're yeah. not going to be like, hey, I fell asleep in U.S. history class. Don't tell me. I don't want to be spoiled. So, you know... I, I get that not everybody studies history well enough to know exactly what happened in the Iran hostage crisis, perhaps, but that's a pretty well-known event in recent history. I don't know. All right, so we also got a bunch of emails clarifying the legality of whether or not you're a bad person for watching content uh, from iPlayer over in, or I guess iPlayer, or in your case, uh, ITV, for... Um, uh, for Downton Abbey, it says uh, this is from Ashley. We have, we got a number of these. And well, some no, of this were- doesn't relate to Downton Abbey because Downton Abbey's on ITV. This is about the BBC. No, no, no there was another one that says. Uh, oh, I don't it, know which it, one it you're looking at then. Uh, it says here, dear frame rate, the actual rules of watching episodes on BBC iPlayer is that if you're watching live streams, 
without a TV license, you are breaking the law. If you are playing catch up on TV on iPlayer, which is what I did when I watched Sherlock without a TV license, you are not breaking the law. For an ITV player, which is what you did, 4OD and Demand 5, you do not need to have a TV license to watch their content. Yeah, I knew, that. I knew that. We mentioned that. Yeah, this is how students like me avoid paying license fee and watch TV. If you need a TV license per house, if you're receiving live TV through an aerial cable or satellite, uh, they do give you letters to remind you to pay, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, that's from Ashley, and we got another very detailed letter that was too long, unfortunately, for us to read on the air. But uh, but thank you to everybody who responded to clear that up. Yeah, thanks, Ashley. Uh, appreciate that. So interesting to know that you can catch up and not have to pay a license, but you can't watch iPlayer Live. That's just, that's crazy. That's, that's weird stuff. That's well, thank awesome. you, everybody, uh, for watching or listening. Uh, you can find us live on live.twit.tv every Monday at 3 p.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, you can also email us. Our email address is framerate at twit.tv. And uh, you can get us on demand anytime you want, twit.tv slash fr. If you want to stick around for the spoiler zone about The Walking Dead, do so. Otherwise, stop playing the video or listening right now or you're going to get spoiled. The Titanic sinks. So the greenest people. <laughs> Go away. All right, let's jump right in. Hang tight, here we go. Silent Green is people! Well, my friend, we got to see the governor finally. What did you think? Uh, man, I hate to start on a down note, but um, uh, the governor, to really work, has to be equal parts charming and seductive and truly horrifying in the his darkness and i i did not feel it with the governor even though i mean i thought it was a good episode you didn't think it was charming you didn't think he was dark enough or both well unfortunately the way they sold his charm was with reasoned discourse and that sort of takes away from thinking there's a darkness in him that that you should be terrified to look at in the face you, does that make sense I, I get a little bit of what you're talking about because having read the book, I have a certain conception of the governor and watching this guy felt like he was a little bit white bread. Uh, you know, I, I was like, uh, and it's that darkness thing that I'm with you on. Like, I don't see but the shadow in this guy as badly as I saw in the original governor. But this is it. But, it, but it, he, he I think he is charming and reasonable and and keeping you guessing. And the key point for me is Eileen was watching this and she turned to me. She's like, is this a good guy or a bad guy? And I yes. just like stone faced, like, do you want me to spoil it? Yes. And she's like, no, 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 just let me watch. She I mean, was, just... they kept her guessing until they got to the scene where they, they confront the military folks. And right up to the point where he pulls out the gun, she was like, oh, crap. Like, she was totally shocked by it. Okay, well, then maybe maybe this is a case of different mediums because that, that was a different game they played in the comic book. In the comic book, and I think part of it was how they presented him physically. In the right. comic book, he looks like a haggard old biker that you would be kind of leery of. And unfortunately, because they decided to dress him up like a politician, um, as a result, I don't think it really read well or made any sense when Andrea and Michonne were, were suddenly just instantly suspicious of him so much. Now, maybe some of that could be implied from a hard, you know, life on the road, surviving and being scared of everyone. But that wasn't really conveyed to the audience, I didn't think. And, and maybe, I don't know, maybe it is just a different medium. See, for I thought that so part was conveyed well, where Andrea was sort of like, I think I like this guy, but yeah. I'm distrustful of everyone, so I'm going to be careful. Whereas Michonne is like, I never trust anyone at any time anyway, and I want my sword back. And that's okay, inconsistent with her character. That's fine for the characters, but for the audience, we needed something else. In the comic book, because he looked like a bad guy, it meant something that he kind of won you over with his law and order and, uh, and, and you know, running a tight ship and protecting his people. So, like, you as a viewer kind of had to give something up and be like, okay, I'm going to give this guy the benefit of the doubt. And then when you discovered, you know, his dark side, you were legit horrified and you were almost like ashamed of yourself for having believed him for any amount of time. How long in the story um, before you find out that he was a bad guy? Because in this case, you meet him at the beginning of the episode and by the end of the episode, you know, he's a bad guy. You know what I mean? Maybe in the book, if it was a little bit longer, it made more sense to have that 
kind of well, counterbalance the, of looking bad, but not being bad. Oh, wait a minute. No, he's really bad. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, in, in the book, the way I remember it, and I'll be the first to admit that memory is flawed, but the way I remember it is that it's less him that you become disillusioned with and more the town because they uh, set up, this, this might be an actual spoiler if you care about such things, but they, uh, they set up these kind of Friday night gladiator games where people, where they save some of the zombies to slaughter for the amusement of the, of, of the masses. And, and, you know, he justifies it as this is the bread and circus we need to keep law and order in our city. So, so it's sort of the whole society kind of creates this, this dark uh, violence underneath that, that makes you uneasy. And, um, and there is a definite spoiler about uh, uh, what else he keeps in his house that I, that I, that I won't mm-hmm. mention. That is a very specific that makes you instantly aware that he is unhinged and he has some fundamental misunderstandings. Well, but at the end of this episode, we see yeah. something. What did you think of that? Oh, uh, uh, what? I mean, that to me is not the reveal they should have done. I know. I was sitting there with, as soon as he went into that room. I'm like, oh, here we go. Here we go. Yes. Here we, and yes. then they're like, I'm like, oh. What's that? And meanwhile, Eileen is like, oh, my God, that's so, like freaking out. And right. this is where reading the book and not reading the book makes a big difference because I am I was disappointed. I was like, oh, oh, well, that's yes. weird. And she's now, like, that's crazy. Oh, my God, what is that? But think about it from the perspective of, of a television, television producers. You've got two reveals to give hints about what this character is. One of them, according to you and me, is clearly better than the other. Then, of course, you start off with the softer image and then you you get the more powerful one for a follow for a, for a later follow up because then they get uh, yeah the no, no, that's, yeah. that's true that that and and that's why Eileen was freaking out and it totally works I, I get that yeah well and the other thing this lets them do is if they're if they're setting him up as a politician if they're making him kind of slick and you kind of like him and understand but then you're horrified again then in that case if they plan to keep pulling this trick on us. Then they did it exactly right because I was mildly seduced by him and mildly revolted, which means what I want to see next is is increasingly large hits to where finally, you know, we get to the uh, the big face off. And I'll tell you what, again, this is I'm going to speak protectively, but all I can think about is a certain image from the comic books of Michonne crying and why. Yeah. And expl- she explains I'm not crying. Uh, oh, yeah. It's, yeah, it, yeah, it yeah, yeah. No, I'm right there with you. Uh, what are you, my, your buddy, Michael Rooker killed it, killed it. And he was the highlight of the entire thing. It was amazing. Uh, and I'll tell you what, uh, there are hints that maybe Merle as a character has grown or developed or, you know, he certainly, there are uh, also hints that maybe the governor ain't going to remain the governor for the whole run of this series. That's what I think. Oh my gosh. I see a look in Merle's eye when when the governor dresses him down. That's like, for now, I'll follow you for now. And remember, Merle's the one missing a hand. What if, what if this was a giant feint to throw the comic book fans off and we've got the governor? Oh my God, you just blew my mind out. That's amazing. I'm just, Uh, yeah. First of all, Michael Rooker stole every scene that he was in. He was electric. He really was everything that I want the governor to be. Uh, shoot, man, you you really threw me for a loop there. I don't know. Uh, it'll be interesting to see. But 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 so far they're maintaining the record. Season three is in every way everything. I I am as into this series as I was in season one. They are as focused on all the things I care about as they've ever been. And, and let me ask. Actually, I want to ask Jason because you obviously you haven't read the comic books. Mm. Where are you at on the series? Did you did you fall off on season two the way I did? No, I actually really liked season two. Um, you know, my perspective on season two was that it. I mean, obviously things slowed down, but I'm with with Walking Dead. Like, I love all the gore and I love that they explore that because you expect that out of a zombie show. But what I really liked about season two is that they took a little bit of a step back and it became more a drama that happens in the world of a zombie invasion as opposed to a zombie invasion movie or show that you watch where you see the things that you expect to see. They went a little bit further into their minds and I was okay with that. Um, versus, I could understand though the other side which is if you follow the books maybe that's slowing things down and changing course a little too much. Having said that I'm loving this season. This season is by far I'm, I'm most most charged about what I've seen so far this season than any of the previous two seasons. That's awesome man. Well big thumbs up to those guys and if you're not watching the show you should totally get caught up. 
There you go. That's our uh, spoiler zone for today. The Walking Dead uh, kicking it. We've got a totally different feel about it than we had last time. So well done, Walking Dead writers, shooters, staff, actors, the whole team. You're, you're, you're doing a great job. Keep killing those zombies. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Hey, man, so uh, how, what's your transition team? Have you brought in your transition team to, uh, to, to handle your, your relocation to Southern California? What's the spoiler there? Spoiler there. <clears throat> Take two. Nothing. What's up with that? Nothing. Not a thing. You haven't done anything? No. Nope. What? Well, like, <laughs> can I very conspicuously drink from my mug? Like, uh? Uh, is, that, is that a Brian Brushwood mug? Oh, wh- why, Tom? Yes, they did come in. These are the, uh, my, my green cup is conspicuously absent. Uh, we got in the first batch of mugs for the scam pack. Uh, well, they're not. They looks like a pint glass. Yeah, so, well, whatever. It comes from discountmugs.com, so right. it's tempting for me to call, call it that. I'm in.